Okay. This is episode five of the Growing Down podcast. We are joined by Brent Cooper today. Uh, welcome, Brent. Welcome to the show. I feel like you've been an invisible presence here uh, in our conversations on the Discord channel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so Brent is, uh, you've, you've got your hands in many pots, but I, I guess we would call you a meta modern researcher. You're a sociologist. Uh, you've written a number of great articles on what is emerging uh, about the emergencia. That's a term that I think all of us have been circulating on this podcast quite a bit. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed your recent review of Michael Brooks' uh, new book as well. So you're very active in the meta modern sphere, the integral sphere, or the post integral sphere as you would say it. So um, uh, where do we begin? Maybe, maybe we can kind of start off with uh, where you started with all of these concepts and ideas and how you kind of got on the meta modern track. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it, it, in, in some ways that story starts 10 years ago. So I don't know how deep you want to go. <laughs> um, I mean, I got, I got into Hanzi's metamodern space in, at the end, uh, sometime in 2016, <clears throat> onto his mailing list and into that community. Um, but I was active in my own way before. And, you know, this concept of metamodernism has had a, a like a, a complicated history. You know, it's, it's, it's a term that's been used since the 70s, 80s, and 90s, <clears throat> um, but not with any consistency, not with uh, any sort of uh, attraction. Um, but around a decade ago, when I was in grad school, I guess I sort of had my own paradigm shift in how I saw the world and my place in it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of narrative, you know, we're, we're kind of in the in the end times in the end game of of this uh 20 year cycle uh and more specifically the last 10 years right it's become more salient for a lot of us millennials <clears throat> um but you know as as most people know uh around that time vermulen and van den acker were publishing about metamodernism um, very much in their field in kind of cultural studies. And I was at LSE in the sociology department and um, just couldn't seem to get anybody interested in kind of a meta turn or, or that kind of discourse that had opened up for, for one reason or another. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, just, it just became more and more salient uh, for me, even if it didn't for other people. As, as I continued to research and, and develop my own ideas and <clears throat> as that metamodern discourse itself evolved, right? So, the, so that and Hanzi's project kind of crystallized in 2017. And this is, uh, you know, also the time uh, Trump is taking office, more or less in that, that you know, we're, we're officially um, entering the post-truth kind of era. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I've been as, as involved as I can be in, in, in that metamodern community with, with Hanzi as well as others and always trying to, uh, develop it further because it is this kind of, um, future attractor that we're trying to, you know, uh, down, download and unzip, you know, decompress, um, before, you know, before it's too late <laughs> for, for whatever that kind of expression's worth. Like there's a sense in which there, there is no too late. Everything's happening as it should, uh, as, as time unfolds at, at its own, at its own pace. Um, but there's also this sense in which, you know, everybody's talking about the meta crisis, about, about our agency, about how we intervene. <clears throat> and, um, um, a lot of that is going nowhere, to be honest. Like if it can't, if it can't converge on, um, you know, uh, on building consensus or building a coalition, uh, then it's, you know, it's pretty impotent. Um, so, so I've been, I've been torn actually between <clears throat> my kind of identity, if you will, as a meta modern researcher and as a left, as a leftist, right. As somebody who identifies with the progressive cause, um, like, f f you know, at, you know, at, at, at its most deep, 
right? So that's where I try to anchor myself because I think there's a lot of uh, good analysis and good values uh, that, that come from there, especially in this age where, where they're demonized. <clears throat> and uh, and yeah, the people that uh, they get platformed, they get amplified, uh, they, they have a contrarian or a controversial, controversial approach uh, to something, or they might, <clears throat> they might have a hot take that, that goes viral or something. But by and large, it's keeping us uh, stuck in this kind of uh, eternal recurrence. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it there and then we'll go, we'll go to the, the next question or whatever. Yeah, great. Uh, Matt, Ryan, do you have any initial questions for Brent? Uh, we, we have a lot we wanted to cover today. There's just a lot that's been going on. But Yeah, I could, I could jump in here uh, with a pretty, uh, jumping into the deep end with Brent here. Um, maybe you can describe a little bit about how you're reconciling those two aspects of yourself, right? There's the meta-modern part, and then there's the more explicitly political leftist progressive part. And I know that some of that tension has been a point of frustration for you in some of these communities where you've developed a kind of an infamous reputation <laughs> as Laban Pascal was joking about in the intro to the video the, the other day. Um, so maybe you can descri describe a little bit about um, some of your experiences interacting with these emergencia communities and what you're trying to push and how that was going for you. Um, yeah, the, <clears throat> this, this, um is just going to sound like a, a story of personal failure because um, I, I, can't, I can't think of any other way to, to frame it. Other than that, <clears throat> I've been uh, committed to the emergence of a metamodern paradigm and, and contributing to it. Um, but also, you know, and, and, and with that, a kind of post-political move, you know, focus on systems change and, and tra transpartisan policy um, so that's the easy part. The hard part has been, um, you know, uh, stay, staying in the left, stay, staying true to that uh, because it's under attack, right? So the, the way it's manifested is me going back and forth between different extremes of that, conver of that wide conversation. And not enough people are really doing that, right? So the people who, anyone who talks about the left as some sort of abstraction, uh, you want to... We we want to we want to red flag that and <clears throat> sort of um, just you know question some of the underlying assumptions about what you know what who who are they referring to what what are the boundaries of this categorization uh, because by and large it's become a shorthand for just dismissing uh, all of the left uh, movement and you know there's a conflation between uh, pr progressives and the kind of regressive identity left, right? Because there's an unresolved conflict and tension there because really the left uh, broadly should be unified, uh, but they're not. So it's been my, my mission uh, along with lots of other people to, to try to unify that, but, uh, but, but I, I failed, um, uh, you know, in a, in, in a kind of dramatic way, um, uh, because it's almost as if it was it was never really possible, you know, like like a lot of people didn't want it to happen. <clears throat> so my personal experience has been just running into a lot of contrarianism everywhere. Like as soon as you, you have a position, somebody wants to argue with you. Like it doesn't matter if it's something as basic as healthcare. An intelligent person will want to start an argument about that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know we're all kind of taken by, uh, by a thick layer of, of dogma and, and assumptions that inform our political views, right? So when it comes to something like healthcare, it's politicized. The debate is politicized. So it's just, it's insane for anybody to be like, oh, don't politicize healthcare. Don't politicize, uh, you know, gun, gun rights in the time of a crisis, right? Whether it's a mass shooting or an epidemic or whatever, um, and so, um, you know, this, this will always be true. Um, and until the tide of history changes and the dominant narrative, uh, reflects this, we'll, we'll be, we'll be trapped in this, um, 
cycle of, of violence, which is it's both kind of rhetorical violence and actual violence in, in the world. Matt, do you have any, any questions for Brent before I jump in with some? No, I mean, you can go ahead, Jeremy. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, like you, Brent, I've been involved in a lot of, and I kind of deliberately decided to um, Hulk up. We've been referring to you as the Hulk in our private sphere. Um, I've been posting like a madman on Facebook just about um, post-capitalist futures, leftist journalists. Uh, I've been posting Michael Brooks work works and, and I, I've been surprised by the amount of like what you're saying, like, People will come on and argue the, against some basic platform policies like everyone should have health care or we should probably cancel student debt. And, and rather than the question being moved into a sort of a generative discussion, which would be what is the best way to go forward with that? It's always like, well, let's kind of moralize that and actually kind of question the underlying assumptions about that and maybe even argue against it or defend the way we've been doing things as a society. So. Yeah, I think it's been it's been frustrating as a fellow leftist to be engaging in, in these media spheres. Um, and just just looking for some common ground has been difficult. You know, we talk a lot about finding what is the what is the common ground, what is the what is the way to get down to earth in our politics. But social media has been a very difficult place to to locate that. Um, but I wanted to see because specifically in the context of a lot of our communities, like maybe we should define or maybe you should define what the emergencia is and then also like in the first article on what is emerging you mentioned a lot of the emergencia kind of stem from uh ken wilber's influence or systems thinking right so what is the emergencia and why why are they post integral yeah so um so i i i should first say right off the top um, that um, the Emergencia series was commissioned by Perspectiva, right? So that, that's kind of my disclosure that this is like a paid advertisement in a sense. But that being said, I would never for any amount of money write something I didn't agree with or wouldn't, wouldn't stand by. <clears throat> and for this reason, uh, Jonathan and Browson and I, um, Jonathan, the editor, uh, we we had a tug of war over over what the content would be and how it would be written, um, and ultimately I I made it I had to make a lot of concessions to him, um, and ultimately I think it's kind of inconsequential. You know we I think we waste a lot of time, but I believe in the basic idea of the emergencia because the way I wrote it was intending me to sort of be in it right and sort of having a role in. Um, mediating or bringing different ideas together because jonathan's original idea was just hey do a do a profile series on these thinkers like uh schmachtenberger and um jordan hall to some extent and uh uh maya gerpel and um uh, indy indy yohar so these are people that uh jonathan picked and I, I, I kind of agreed uh, with reservations, uh, especially about uh, number three, uh, the article, the third article. But overall, the idea was to tie together disparate ideas and, and political motivations. Um, <clears throat> you know, so I, I, I had to fight hard kind of just to put anything in that, that uh, was related to political economy, you know, or, or political activism like like Brooks's whole angle. And the important uh, thread that ties a lot of that together is integral, right? That's why we're here. That's why I'm talking to you guys, uh, because Michael Brooks has a integral background. It's something he's talked about a lot. And that experience and his present worldview are connected in, in very important ways. So, um, you know, that's a great uh, crossover potential. And also, um, you know, it's kind of a, a great insight because the integral center that we see vis-a-vis people like Wilbur uh, is not left. It, it doesn't matter what they say, like in, in terms of lip service to progressivism, it's not of the left. It's uh, to, to an extent, it's anti-left. Whether it uh, identifies that way or not, you know, it's, um, 
it's been very um, kind of, you know, uh, you know, laudatory of the intellectual dark web, which uh, from my perspective has uh, been a, ne a net negative on sense making, right? So we need to be really clear about that because that's one of the things I wanted to try to move beyond and clarify through the Emergencia series um, that uh, there's some major pathologies here. There's some major um, kind of, uh, you know, overly trodden territory, you know, just going in circles. Um, and, and really, like, the meta crisis is um, uh, crystallized in politics. It, it's, it's located there almost more than anywhere else. It's everywhere else. It is everywhere, but, it, but the politics is the battleground for it. So there's a deep irony to um, trying to advocate for uh, going beyond politics and getting out of the meta crisis and just taking a completely sort of almost hands off kind of indifferent approach, just s sitting on the sidelines and waiting to see what emerges. Right. So I tried to do something a little extra with the Emergencia series and actually through each thinker, try to weave some of their best ideas into a new synthesis with each other. Right, so the last two uh, articles are actually probably the most substantive because they deal with actual socio-technical systems change and, and the hegemony, the force of hegemony and, and counter-hegemony, uh, which links it to uh, like Brooks, Brooks's work again. You know, so there's ways to tie it in. And then the last one is about urban development and the relationship, relationship to progressive politics. So, um, you know, there, there, was, there was a sort of plan to keep going with the series, uh, but uh, um, uh, what, what can I say, Jonathan kind of lost interest and, and my plate is full with many other things, but the, the, as far as I'm concerned, and you guys are too, the, the idea lives on in, in our ability to actually um, put it into practice, right, and, and not just think of it as a series of articles. Um, because that's not really what it is. I mean, when we look at it as a product, it was the result of a lot of uh, creative and substantive uh, like uh, um, uh, coll collaborations, but also uh, disagreements. And uh, yeah, you know, a people in the emergencia that I listed that I tried to uh, put together, it, it didn't work out. So, you know, um, I, I felt like our moment requires great hope and ambition for people to get outside their bubbles. And, uh, and um, it's difficult. Most people are still uh, stuck inside their bubbles. And this isn't a, a real partisan critique because I had, you know, I'm, I, I'm of the left and I'm endeared to the left movement of which the center and a lot of metamodernists have like almost no awareness. Um, but at the same time, I think I equally failed to try to sew those communities together, you know, to try to give the left a metamodernism to work with and vice versa, give, give metamodernists some sort of moral political compass. Yeah, well said. I, I apologize because my internet's cutting in and out here. So I'll just make this a quick question. So Brent, if you succeeded beyond your wildest dreams of let's say infusing the left with this metamodern paradigm, what would be the practical significance or impact of that? How can that enrich our understanding of progressivism and leftism and what implications would that have in the political sphere? Yeah, good question. I think there's two answers to it. One is, um, <clears throat> one is you know, the, the prospects for, un for unity, which means the left would actually take power in, in a kind of Bernie Sanders presidency, we'd actually be able to uh, get a lot more done and speak more honestly in public discourse. Um, but now that the kind of, um, you know, the, the kind of field has changed, uh, the, the project is still important, but um, it doesn't have the same kind of unity prospects and implications like it's a coin toss whether Biden is going to lose to Trump or become the, become a shitty president. <laughs> like there's not a lot of potential there. Um, so nevertheless, the 
to, to try to answer your question in the other way, the, the, the benefit or the, the function of uh, bringing metamodernism and the left together is to um, actually have a consensus and one that is not just like against Trump as a kind of, or, you know, as an organizing principle, but understands the deeper issues. Um, so the situation we're right in right now um, with regard to politics is like, we're, we're still on the right side of history. We're, we're still the good guys. And I think, I think Bernie being sort of pummeled and, and bullied and then um, uh, suspending his campaign, I don't want to say dropping out because, you know, he can still get delegates. He can see still on the ballot. Um, that, that's uh, where, you know, people are going to regret that. They're going to come to regret that, whether it takes a, a few more weeks or a few more months or a few more years. This is the stupidest, lowest point in American history, relatively, because we had a real opportunity to, um, to, uh, to, uh, you know, um, just invest in common sense and in a political figure who has a, a profound uh, track record, you know, going back to the 60s. And when you really look at it, and this is where I want to be clear, because I have experience in going th around these different worlds, there's not been sufficient communication or dialogue between the, the liberals and the left, right? So they think that we're all going to get in line for a, for a Biden presidency. And, you know, to some extent, like, like, uh, you know, there's, you know, people can go vote for Biden. That's like, I, 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 would, I would vote for Biden if I was American, but that's, voting here isn't the point. The point of having a discourse and sense-making and arguments is to, um, I like the phrase from uh, one of the Matrix films, like you've already made the choice. The point is to understand why you made the choice, right? So really the choice has always been um, somebody like Bernie, somebody who's authentic, uh, somebody who's, uh, both radical and kind of pragmatic and, and um, accessible. Like we, we all had hopes he would be the new center. Um, but so that, that dream in the official capacity has been crushed by the establishment. So the lines have been drawn. We, we know that they hate us. Like we don't, there's no pretense now that, uh, that there's uh, compassion and we're on the same side. Like, I think they hate us. Um, and that's that that is what's going to kind of uh, be um, uh, kind of uh, excavated or whatever through these uh, therapy sessions and through these um, conferences that we're going to be having kind of a post post mortem, you know, like, how did this happen? Because a lot of us know what happened in 2016. But uh, but the lesson wasn't learned by the establishment. So they want to repeat. Um, and uh, yeah, just to try to bring it full circle, like, like it's, it's a coin toss whether Biden gets in or not, but it's not, it, it's the wrong question. You know, no intelligent person should be saying that, uh, oh, I just want to stop Trump. That's my whole motivation and, and uh, thinking process for voting. That means uh, they've already won. You know, the, the, the powers that be behind both parties that are pitting us against each other like that, they've already won. So people think I'm like the most argumentative and the most aggressive. Uh, but in many ways, I'm the least like I'm just tired of everybody's, um, you know, uh, partisanship and both sides ism and uh, falling for disinformation, uh, you know, befriending Nazis, because <laughs> because uh, you think that they're not Nazis and Nazis don't exist anymore. Like, there's all these kinds of delusions. Um, and, um, and, the, and the kind of the meta crisis uh, and the meta crisis community is like basically going to self implode. And I think uh, for a lot of people, there, there's that kind of uh, subconscious like death wish, like things have to get worse before they get better. Uh, I think there is a little bit of truth to that. Uh, that, you know, we should, we should be prepared for such things, but, um, 
to actually uh, philosophize based on that assumption is I, th I think it's a kind of brain worm. Like, like it's really dangerous to think like that, like overly pragmatically, like that you think you can actually do all the calculations and figure out uh, what needs to happen. Um, you know, for me, Bernie was, was the opposite. Like he was just a genuine person with the objectively best policy platform and people couldn't see uh, either of those two things uh, through the noise of how he was uh, constructed in, in the media. I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> I don't know if I answered it or not. I think Matt's got a... Well, I, I think following up with Ryan's question, it was just summarizing if you had the, you know, the the ideal oh, world yeah. of if things were to collaborate, what would it look like? Right, yeah. Yeah, let me let me try to recapitulate because I think the ideal world, if Bernie was still in the race, would be a Bernie presidency and we would collaborate behind that. The ideal world now is damage control. You know, it's triage. It, it's all this fucking bullshit that, um, that uh, could have been avoided, like, like uh, in terms of the high death tolls and, you know, just enormous cost on the economy. So, so this crisis has been in the making forever. Like we've, we've known it's been coming in one form or another. And um, yeah, be because we don't have consensus going into it, it's going to be a lot harder. And, and uh, I, watched an, I watched Matt Chrisman, um, you know, he gave an hour kind of um, uh, whatever uh, talking uh, podcast or whatever, just talking to uh, the camera, like a live stream. And, and he went through a lot of these things like, uh, you know, just, just for him and for me and for a lot of us, it wasn't that Bernie was the savior or anything. Bernie was the minimum viable option. So we wouldn't... Um, be living in this crazy context, trying to deal with all this bullshit with a bunch of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of shock doctrine, you know, people that are going to take advantage of this. This is disaster capitalism, right? This, you, you watch all the, the ghouls that we're familiar with, um, you know, um, uh, passing, you know, stimulus packages that uh, benefit the super rich and, you know, um, uh, doing insider trading um, and all this kind of stuff. So none of, none of it is a surprise to me, but I think there's a naivete in the center and, and a self-delusion uh, that, that the center is not as corrupt as it is, you know? Um, and, and people like Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, as, as, uh, as normalized as they are, I think the left proper has seen through the facade um, through various means, right? Through understanding history better than they do and, um, you know, investigative journalism. Uh, and I'm not talking about like the real partisan conspiracy theorizing from either side. I'm talking like, you know, what, whatever that may be, like the Clinton body count or whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about real substantive stuff, like just ba basic facts, facts about Joe Biden's record, like, you know, crime bill, Iraq war, bankruptcy bill, blah, blah, blah. Like the list goes on. And so there's no, um, the pattern I've, I've observed in general between the, 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 the leftist um, sort of media sphere. And let me just clarify who that is, right? Because uh, I made the point earlier about how <clears throat> there isn't a lot of communication, but let's say, you know, the Intercept, Current Affairs, Michael Brooks show, you know, the Young Turks, um, um, there, uh, you know, to, to an extent, like New Republic. Um, and then, you know, in different places, there's people placed in, in legacy media, like I think Chris Hayes is a great ally most of the time. Um, but by and large, you have this kind of liberal discourse and then a leftist discourse, and they don't interact. Um, the left criticizes all of that, but they don't interact, you know, uh, like, and then, and then you have the uh, diverse, let's say, intellectual dark web, um, who also doesn't interact with the left. They just, they just attack the left constantly. But they, they rarely, um, like, point to specific actors. They almost never have good faith takes on their content. 
it, it's just bizarre, really, how transparent it is. And um, this, is, this has been the dominant narrative for the last four years in the, in the Trump era. So what would um, <clears throat> a post-integral or, or meta-modern approach to leftist politics look like? Would there be, is there a role of mediation in the meta-modern approach that might be able to bridge that gap? Because this is, the, this is sort of the, the, the topic that, um, the, the implicit topic that Steve McIntosh was describing in his interview with us, uh, th this idea that, you know, there's these different entrenched polarities and camps and they don't speak to one another. They're coming from different worldviews. They're coming from different value systems and the difficulty and also the responsibility of somebody who's quote unquote integral or metamodern is to find or, or, or have a kind of a literacy between these polarities of entrenchment. So would a metamodern view or approach to this particular problem in our culture be the role of the mediator? Uh, or, or what else, you know? Yeah, and I think there's multiple levels for that to happen on, right? Because the average Democrat or Republican voter um, need a different type of mediation, right? And they need, it, they need a media to be there for them on a daily basis, right? So ideas like, like McIntosh's and mine about depolarization need to get in on an institutional level into these uh into this mass media right whether it's fox news or cnn like they know that they're polarizing they know that they're bullshitting um and then you know at the level of think tanks and thinkers there needs to be that as well um and so i think it requires different uh types of mediation different types of intervention but it needs to go way beyond just um you know no like like knowing what the dogma is of either side like like there like when we think about the center there can be a very ideological and defunct center which is what i think we have now there's not i mean there's there's some uh genuine centrists but there's not a lot by and large it's very partisan people right so the center has become its own wing um <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, what is, what is the, wh where do we go from here? What is the role for mediation and metamodernists and all that? It's definitely like literacy, first and foremost, something we talk a lot about, you know, so I've admonished a lot of people in, in the metamodern community, community just for not doing the basic readings, whatever that may be, whether it's Hansi or Vermeulen and Van Den Acker or, or uh, something I've dug up, you know, they're not engaging. And, you know, I've encountered uh, tr uh, integralists who are Trump supporters. And, um, you know, uh, on a, you know, in, in a philosophical uh, kind of like intellectual context, that, that math doesn't add up, right? We just need to be honest about that. <laughs> like, I have no problem with conservatives per se, but uh, conservatives have no obligation whatsoever to uh to um support any leader on their side right it, it, especially when it's when it's trump it's just um and and you know in these arguments i've i've provided tons of conservatives who are anti-trump right which is interesting it's not hard to find them like like i point to david from i'm not i'm not a fan of david from obviously but uh you know there's something dangerous about all these centrists like david brooks david from um uh who um you know they're anti-trump but what what does that mean like that's that's empty they want to go back to some normalcy that never existed um yeah i don't know where i'm going with that well i have a question brent i know you've you've brought up kind of this teal new deal um, and I think I, the way I view it is almost looking for a way on how do you integrate all this? How do you present the problems as here's what it is? And then what are the solutions? Can you tell us a little bit about the Teal New Deal and how that got started? Yeah, um, so it's a little bit um, on one hand kind of spontaneous and um, me sort of going with the flow with the integral left group um and and uh and uh so like you guys and and all that and you know as much as i've tried to get away from integral it seems to keep catching up 
so I've, I've, uh, I, I wrote at length, like a kind of uh, comparison of integral and metamodern, metamodernism and how they each respectively uh, orient themselves to the intellectual dark web, right? And it's kind of opposite. And so this is an interesting um, uh, kind of uh, observation, I guess, um, because, uh, because a lot of people did because of Hansi's books, right? A lot of people just kind of uh, assume integral and metamodernism are kind of the same thing or one's an extension of the other um, in, in a kind of crude way. And actually Hansi, um, you know, addresses this confusion in his books. So I was trying to add to that and, and help clarify and also bring in other evidence um, of course, from outside Hansi, that metamodernism is this idea that integral cannot just capture and, and move into. Because, um, you know, despite there being a great kind of schism in integral communities, a lot of people are pretending like that didn't happen. And that without reintegration, just this integral free for all, that it's, that it's still going to lead somewhere. And then at the same time, a lot of these people are making moves to uh, like co-opt metamodern discourse. Uh, they're just completely different things. Nevertheless, um, you know, there, there is fruit there uh, and there is other small I integral approaches. And, and I think I'm finding them too. Like I can, I can bring in a thinker and be like, hey, this person's integral even though they weren't using that specific language. Like, so for, for Jeremy, that's Gebser. And uh, somebody I brought up to him, who, uh, to, to Jeremy, who I want, I, I need myself to go back and dive in more and maybe write an article about this, but is um, Jose Ortega y Gasset. He's a Spanish philosopher. And there's just a lot of overlap in terms of you know, philosophy of history and our kind of uh, duty to be uh, social agents, you know, and, and fight, the, fight the mass man, so to speak. Like Ortega has a book called Revolt of the Masses. And it's interesting because he identifies a kind of mass man uh, trope, not just in ordinary people, but in elites too. So in, in elites and masses, there's a kind of mass man kind of mentality which is like homogenized culture, like very normy, very uh, like just like not um, not progressive or revolutionary, right? They 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 just uh, kind of passive consumers in the world. Like so, this is something I got really into for a while because you know it, it dovetails with critical theory and uh, Marcuse's one-dimensional man and all these sorts of things. And so I think today, like. Um, you know, there is a kind of elite rule in pathology, but um, those kind of works helped bust the myth for me that um, these, we shouldn't um, believe too much in hierarchy and meritocracy because there's idiots everywhere, <laughs> to, to put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my understanding of, of uh, the Teal New Deal when you proposed it, and evidently it's it's been proposed more than once in integral circles as as a phrase different meanings but um was that you know it was written or, or kind of conceived in the moment where bernie was actually doing very well in this political cycle and i think we had he had just won nevada there had been a kind of a watershed moment in the in the institutional media that we're suddenly going like, oh, maybe we were wrong. <laughs> Chris Matthews steps down from MSNBC. <laughs> that, that wave of events started to be uh, started to happen, and um, uh, my perception of the Teal New, Teal New Deal was a way to capitalize on this cultural momentum and, and suggest that um, in integral theory language, right, which which has a very kind of stage centric, um, you know, what is in, what is t technically kind of emerging or unfolding in the evolution of consciousness, um, that a teal New Deal, getting on board with the policies of the Green New Deal, uh, of the new left, of what we've been talking about in terms of economic populism, was part of this cultural evolution, and that we needed to kind of get on board with it and understand it, and represent it, and actually kind of um, 
uh, help it, somehow assist it, right? Even if we believe that we are somehow transpartisan or have a kind of a higher stage of understanding the evolution of, of values, nevertheless, on the ground, here's what's emerging right now. Let's help push it along or let's help kind of cultivate its emergence. So that, that's the kind of feeling. And generally speaking, I, I'm I'm very much on board with that, whether or not I'm uh, an integral theorist developmentalist, I still feel that that is what is emerging, right? So, um, and I think I think our plan is still to kind of put it out there somewhere because the, the Green New Deal is still out there and, and Bernie is still out there. As you mentioned, he's he's going to be on the ballot. He's going to be using that to 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 utilize uh, political leverage when, when we get to the um, uh, the, the, the convention and whatever that looks like. Um, so, so there's, there's just so much to kind of unpack there, but I think one analogy in the history of the integral theory movement was maybe during the Obama years when Terry Patton kind of went ahead and said, let's be pro Obama as integralists. And here's why. And I, I remember him doing some um, interesting and kind of similar maneuvering in the sense of like whether or not you think he is integral and we have some all of us here have talked about like well is being a good speaker being integral is being a good mediator being integral right we have those questions but regardless Patton was like regardless of that like there's an unfolding happening in culture we should we should get behind that right so I think this is sort of in that same spirit um, yeah I like the way you you set all that up you know, if I missed a bunch of things, you gave it a good reintroduction and background there because it did kind of emerge at that specific time in a more focused way. And it was around the same time that I was uh, having conversations with Jim Rutt and Terry Patton and they didn't go so well, you know, from either perspective. And and part of the Teal New Deal, like I kind of offered it to Terry before I'd written anything, but it was to um, sort of provide a structure for us to come together uh, when there was absolutely nothing prior, um, you know, bringing us together. So I, I had to take initiative to, to bring us together, <clears throat> but that still wasn't enough, you know, like we needed a structure and we needed mediation even to have that conversation. So um, uh, yeah. And, 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 and in the broader sense, you alluded to the Obama years and, you know, the intentions there is that that also has to be part of what we disclose and, and uh, kind of debrief about, you know, about what the role of Integral is as a community and, and where, where it's naive and co-opted and where it has really no uh, political literacy, which is difficult to be fair, right? Like, like, uh, I'm coming into this meeting today, you know, listening a bit to Rob Smith's uh, interview with Corey and looking at his book and like, there's a lot of serious research and consideration there, right? So it's very high level, but at the same time, that makes it that much harder to miss the tiny little details that are out of place, right? Because a lot of, you know, a lot of these uh, integralists are kind of thinking together or whatever, but they're also not at all engaged in the left movement and in the left discourse you know that that just becomes uh very clear from from the odd tweet or from just the the consistent uh narrative going on um on these more official integral platforms and um you know there's this sense in which especially with the coronavirus now like i i've already felt this for for years like it's the end times in a sense but not in a completely um like end of the world kind of way, but in a, in a transition sense. And uh, <clears throat> it's, it's um, like, I can, I can admit that I've failed and been wrong, but, but quite frankly, it's embarrassing that all of us like have been so wrong and so uh, just failing to come together when, when it mattered for the things that matter. You know, we all, who think we're on the kind of edge or vanguard of something really <clears throat> have to do a double move where we uh, stay committed, um, but also uh, like further admit we have no idea what we're doing. And I've already seen a lot of people doing this, you know, like uh, you take like um, Peter Lindbergh and the, the STOA community and all those kind of workshops and stuff. Um, 
they're they're doing something that's uh, kind of uh, kind of therapeutic and strategic for their own um, kind of uh, movement to to for them for themselves to get through this difficult time and to help others but it it's it falls short of the um the biggest points of leverage in the system right like it's still still committing the same problem i was critiquing before is that they don't really have a politics and where where that vacuum is it's being um being taken up by a lot of reactionaries, you know, and like a lot of a lot of Trump supporters voted for Biden in the primary. Like we're 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 all fighting here, getting hoodwinked by a very aggressive right that doesn't care. Like we can say whatever we want, good things about conservative people, but the Republicans as a movement um, only cares about winning and 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 owning the libs. Like it's incredibly nihilistic. Is, is what I'm saying. And so to some extent, it's equally nihilistic for, you know, Obama Democrats uh, to, um, you know, uh, pull out all the stops to actually put, 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 put Biden forward as the nominee instead of Bernie. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about going back for a second to Jeremy's um comment on mediation, the role of mediation in all this. And of course, as a mediator, I'm totally for mediation. I really believe in the importance of it. The one caveat that I would add is that mediation, in my opinion, has to have an emergent quality to it, where something, a new paradigm, the new paradigm that we're trying to birth, the integral, metamodern, whatever, game B paradigm, um, has, this, has a kind of creative force that makes it more than the sum of its parts that came before it. And my, my problem with some of the, the more mainstream incarnations of mediation, which a lot of mainstream integralists would conflate with being pure, you know, being integral, is that it takes place in the limited paradigm, right? I'm fixing and mending and mediating two dichotomies in a paradigm that's outdated. And if it doesn't have an emergent and transcendent quality um, that can be birthed out of that mediation process, uh, it's kind of like the the, the uh, metaphor I always use. It's like mediating between slaves and slave owners and getting a better deal for the slaves, right? Yeah. So so I'm I'm curious in the Teal New Deal, um, how can we create these conditions of emergence and maybe bring people who have who are not really politically literate into the conversation and to try to create something that they can get on board with, so that that apolitical vacuum isn't filled by reactionary bullshit. Yeah, this is a, um, a a specific point of kind of tension between like Lehman and I, for example, that it like, I think he embodies the open ended emergence approach. And I actually um, consciously am trying to embody the kind of teleological specific vision. And uh, I don't actually want to, like with the Teal New Deal, I'm not actually proposing that everybody just uh, get on board with what I'm saying, but at least the dialogue between Lehman and I creates that space for that vision to be heard. Because there's a paradox going on here too. Like everybody is talking about how, you know, through emergence, they don't know what what the what's going to come next what it looks like and they're okay with that they're kind of leaning into this agnosticism and i think that is a little bit dangerous because you open up for the opportunists and the reactionaries to say like yeah, like to to come in posing as the answer to the question um i think when we look at the opposite like the convergence approach a, teleolo a teleological approach there can also be different versions to that, right? So it doesn't have to be my synthetic version, but, uh, but, but we can at least play with the tension between that, between teleology and what is called teleonomy, right? So that, that there can be a kind of like, it's the teleology is directed by the end state and teleonomy, the end state is open. So it's process directed. You don't know what you're gonna get exactly. And that evolution works in both ways. And, and especially when it comes to the human level where we have, a, we have the ability to choose to intervene on the agency of development, um, these, these ideas become all the more salient. So maybe we can at least oscillate 
between those two versions, right? And that's to, to some extent, implicitly, that's what Layman and I are trying to um, demonstrate and exercise. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think um, what we're really, I mean, part, part of this is, is um, some of the, I, I keep going back to the kind of the, the historical uh, influences in, let's say, the integral theory community. But, um, you know, with, with Wilbur's work himself being a boomer, <laughs> being, and I don't mean that in a pejorative, just in a generational sense, uh, the context in which he was writing integral theory in the 1990s, at a time where, you know, deconstruction and sort of the postmodern turn was sort of at its height in terms of cultural potency in academics. Um, so he, he received a lot of pushback. He received a lot of deconstruction. And I think, you know, in, in some ways, he's been kind of hypersensitized to the postmodern and deconstructive turn. And that has in turn influenced not only his work and his research on an integrative meta theory, but also the community that has that he's attracted. And so um, unfortunately, I feel like this has left a kind of historical gap in very brilliant people being attracted to integral theory or integral meta theory and actually being kind of left leaning and actually kind of going, let me find a way to synthesize this work or respond to this work in an integral way. Um, that's been kind of missing. And instead it's been kind of an attractor for, you know, a place to, to voice your complaints about, you know, green meme or postmodernism or the left that eats itself. It's been a kind of, um, uh, a, a release valve for our frustrations, right? So historically, Integral has been, it hasn't been a very good place to theoretically or even culturally kind of explore um, a way to take the postmodern turn um, and, and do something interesting with it. And that's unfortunate because I think, you know, uh, just having read that initial essay um, by Timotheus and Vermulin about um, notes on metamodernism, just even in that initial essay that they're saying, you know, there's this emergent structure of feeling we can identify. So it's like, um, I, I kind of, my frustration with integral when I was more invested in the, the integral theory movement was not getting that structure of feeling that was emerging in the 21st century, right? Not actually being able to get on board with it and still having 20th century debates about, you know, what is after, you know, the middle way politics? What is after, you know? Um, in, in some ways, it's a kind of a pre-9-11 meta theory. Um, and, and I think we need something that is that is sort of beyond that at the moment. Or somebody who can brilliantly take that and kind of revision it. Yeah, well said. I mean, yeah. But I mean, personally, I do think uh, we're kind of at the end of uh, the integral era. But... But I say that referring to what we're critiquing here, not not critiquing you guys. And that's that's the difficulty here is like, how do we how do we parse that? How do we <clears throat> split the difference? And um, it, it's OK. This is the thing. Like we, we're going to transcend and include integral like it's not going to go away. But but uh, but it needs this great reckoning. Right. Where people who are like veterans in it or people who are new to it uh kind of get briefed on the same level so the same mistakes aren't being repeated because in the past few years we, there's been this resurgence and it's just been so irresponsible in terms of the public discourse because for those who are already critical of integral it's like what the hell is going on like they they think jordan peterson is integral like we're just we're just wasting time really um because you know, there's, it's not that there's nothing interesting to say there, but we got to be real careful about our wording. So this integral idea has been, you know, uh, variously abused and weaponized, and and we're we're trying to do it in just an integrative sense, like like continually upgrading our worldviews. And <clears throat> you know, I, I got a lot of training that that you wouldn't get through an integral institute, so to speak, and, and vice versa. I've self-studied plenty of it. So I have a spiritual side and whatever. It's like, it's not interesting anymore at the end of the day. And that's what's so refreshing about, about you guys and Michael Brooks and, and, and that kind of stuff, because uh, I just want to give a, an anecdote, kind of my, my long-term personal experience with integral is, you know, I discovered it in the nineties, like a lot of people, I was attracted to the 
big charts, big graphics, colorful, and you know, lots of uh, abstraction and. Uh, I thought this was this was great, but you know, I kind of like was turned off by the you know the self help aspect and the consulting kind of uh, business kind of aspect of it. It was all very business and cultish, and it was I you know I could see this without even being in it. Uh, so that was like in the '90s, you know, I'm like a teenager, like uh, you know, believing in conspiracy theories and trying to figure out the world. Um, I never like wrote it off completely. I just try to tried to move on. And <clears throat> like uh, seven years ago, I was making this film, The Abstract, and it was in part to parody systems like Integral. Uh, n like I, it wasn't my main target because I was targeting things like The Secret, right? This kind of that kind of uh, positive thinking ideology and and business model again. Um, but Integral was was part of it and and uh this guy in an acting class he's like an integral coach right and and uh, i was talking to him about it and he's like oh this is kind of like integral and i didn't have the heart to tell him like it was a parody of uh things like integral because it's it's sufficient up to a point right but then you can go beyond anyways so this this anecdote continues uh, you know, I tried to get this guy was an actor. So I tried to get him involved and be in the film and it never happened. I eventually like made the film and, you know, promoted it and all that. And then it, it, it's, it became, uh, it's, it's the background of my current project, right? Which is abstraction research. So it's all still connected out of nowhere. This guy, uh, reaches out to me on, uh, LinkedIn, like a month or two ago let's say two months ago. And he's like, Hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And like, he's still an integral coach. He's actually just approaching me to self promote. And I try to engage him, uh, you know, uh, in a friendly way in an inviting way. I'm like, Hey, actually I'm working with a bunch of integralists like on saving the world. And he's just like, like, he just kept wanting to help me like personally develop and with my, my, my vision. And I'm like, I'm like, Hey, like, actually I'm already doing it and you can like be a part of it if you want, but he wasn't interested, right? He was only interested in like selling his skills as an integral life coach. And that's just such a turnoff for me. Like it, it you know, it, it, and it, and it's indicative of the depth of this problem, right? So, so I'm not saying this is Wilbur's fault, but there needs to be a kind of accountability and kind of, um, you know, like it's up to Wilbur or whoever to kind of take responsibility for, for some of these things. Like this is the kind of lifestyle and branding that you promoted. And <clears throat> where I come into contact with it, it's always a kind of a disheartening experience in that sense. So That's really funny, Brent, because I can share a lot of your frustrations and, and um, allergies to some of those things you mentioned, the, the kind of insulated, navel-gazing, culty, self-helpy, Boulder, Colorado kind of a vibe or ethos that sometimes the integral community presents. This is something, though, that I've been um, thinking about, though, is given all these critiques, what do, you, what do you see the role of spirituality or something like that playing in mainstream uh, progressive politics. I know Michael Brooks talks about this. And I think that if you do a bad job of integrating those things, you get someone like Marianne Williamson, who's very easily made fun of and kind of became a mockery saying, oh yeah, well, she won the world, the vote in the astral world. And, you know, people making those kind of jokes like with, you know, yeah. Kyle Kalinske, you know, who's a very atheist, secular kind of guy, took a lot of shots at her. And, and, I, and she said a lot of things to me that just made me totally cringe. But I yeah. do think that he, Michael Brooks is right in the sense that the right has for a long time monopolized the narrative on um, you know, ethics, morality, meaning of life, uh, spirituality through like, Christian conservatism. And, some, and so that the left needs some kind of counter narrative to captivate people's you know, inspiration on that, on that kind of spiritual level. So do you have any thoughts about that? Like, do you agree with Michael Brooks? And if so, what yeah. do you think that would look like? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Cause Michael Brooks actually does say, you know, half joking that Marianne Williamson was his second choice. Um, because if you can see past that kind of that, uh, that stuff, that in, you know, inconvenient rhetoric that puts off some people, she does have a, a, she does have her head on straight. She does have the right policies, you know, and her heart's in the right place, endorsing Bernie Sanders. 
<clears throat> um, so there's two things that have happened. One is kind of there, there is a spirituality on the left that's just not being recognized, right? And this is like, like Cornell West, right? Embodies it and, 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 his, and his life work does. And so with that too, there's a whole kind of idea of liberation theology and social justice, which are, which are necessarily spiritual. And, and the right or let's say whatever, the qu Quillette, you know, the, the centrists, People like James Lindsay, who pr pr pretend to be on the left, but are really just, uh, really just crystallizing and formalizing a, a right-wing talking point that that the, that social justice is a religion, right? And so that he means it as a pejorative, right? But at the same time, like this is this is already true. Like a lot of people take up that that struggle in a kind of religious way, like with conviction, with faith, um, with moral, moral uh, righteousness. <clears throat> and so that's one side of it. The other side of it is like the, the, the neoliberal corporate Democrats, people like Clinton, right? They've, they've diluted any sense of uh, spirituality. They've become just fully secular, but also drifting rightward, right? Everything's being pulled rightward by this like gravity of, of money, let's say. So it distorts that whole thing, right? So it's not even like, yes, the right has kind of monopolized like family values or whatever. Um, and, and um, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, organized religion kind of, uh, um, like um, uh, partnerships, let's say, like like um, like it's often said, like Mike Pence is like a Christian fascist. You know, he's like the the marriage of church and state in a way, in a way that uh, should be kept separate. <clears throat> so um, the problem to 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 wrap it up, the problem is maybe it's not a lack of spirituality on the left. It's just a lack of coalition and a lack of um, solidarity around that spirituality. You know, like, like uh, I think we've already got it. We've, we've got the, the kind of quest in us. This is a, a spiritual journey for the, for the whole planet. And, and um, you know, the left is trying to shepherd that transition with basic fundamental things like healthcare, right? Like, like education. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, does that kind of answer it? Like we've, we've got a spirituality and it, it can be more crystallized, but we have to be careful at the same time uh, how much that's actually uh, married to the political movement. Um, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think also another another element of this. I'm just I'm kind of thinking aloud here, but um, part of you know, let's say um, our understanding of spirituality and the understanding of spirituality that Marianne Williamson comes from. It's West Coast California consciousness, uh, stemming historically from the 1970s and the human potential movement, right? So the, the and those particularly were emerging from. What, what, which is what I see Hanzi using to some degree, uh, more of the kind of existential self-actualizing dimensions that like when you have basic subsistence in place, um, the, the more sublimated and rarefied aspects of being a human being, finding meaning in life, uh, having self-actualization, having um, sublime experiences is, is permitted. There's more space for that. There's more room for that. Um, so that's sort of what I, I think even integral theory kind of stems from. Like Wilbur was writing the spectrum of consciousness. He used to be considered part of the transpersonal movement to begin with and transpersonal psychology. So in, in integral theory terms, that's very kind of upper left in terms of, um, you know, individual oriented spirituality, right? What is your experience? Let's not talk about religion. Let's talk about individual spiritual experience, right? And we have the history of like William James being popular in the consciousness culture, the varieties of religious experience, et cetera, and Buddhism. Like there, there's a kind of a, 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 a constellation of uh, historical interest in this kind of individual oriented spiritual traditions and practices in, in American culture and Western culture uh, after the 1950s. So that's kind of the context in which that's emerged. What I find to be interesting though, because you're right, like it, 
spirituality shouldn't even be owned by by the right or even by the you know consciousness culture human potential movement because these are much broader existential themes that apply to everyone you know that apply to the liberation theology to um more of the the politics and activism in the global south in terms of latin america um catholicism is married a little bit more closely to the political uh so I, I guess it's a very complex question and an issue. And if you move out of, let's say, like internet leftist discourse, right, which pretty much always shits on spiritual whatever, right, um, then, you know, you see it actually being applied. So I think you're absolutely right that, like, what's not missing is the spirituality. What's missing is the ability to, to create coalition and also uh, create a framework, right? We need to enframe this in a new context rather than leave it to the right or leave it to just yeah. the counterculture. Yeah. There, and there's this, um, like <clears throat> this hegemony of like Mick mindfulness, right? Like, like there's aware, an awareness of it. Like didn't, didn't Wilbur come up with the term boomeritis? I think so. Yeah. Right. But, but the way I see it is he like, he is still, he is infected with boomeritis. So it's like he identified the problem correctly, but then he's committing it. Um, And uh, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about that whole history, which you painted and also other things that are kind of exclusive to the left uh, consciousness, spiritual consciousness, and that's psychedelics. Right. And so that's a big part of all these communities to various extents. But it has failed to come full circle and, and be political. And there's, there's historical reasons for that. Like, I think the consciousness culture has uh, lost sight of how that has been torn apart since the 60s, right? It's been a kind of strategic um, <clears throat> narrative to, to divide and conquer the, the left, you know, to make it uh, impotent, um, to, to, to divide it from its roots and to keep keep the the world fragmenting and keep the um like contrarianism is a function that keeps reproducing this right so we keep arguing the the minutia of different things while missing the greater context of a of a shift right so my uh, understanding of a paradigm shift and the one that we're going through is it's not just along one axis like like oh we're gonna go from uh trump to bernie or or whatever like that's a great kind of narrative but when we talk about the the different um sectors that are going to be impact like i talked with daniel gortz yesterday about education and this is one sector out of many like military like economy you know governance all these things and they all have to change so we can talk about a paradigm shift in education and what that looks like, but it's, it's interlocked with like, let's say a dozen other systems or sectors that have to change at the same, at the same time. So people lose sight of that because they're, they might be in one particular system or they might have an ax to grind against another particular system and they want to see something switch. But by and large, because we can't see the big picture, uh, the collective intelligence defaults to the worst choice it's like a race to the bottom right so that choice was trump um in 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 the case of 2016 and in this case it's it's biden (laughs) that's the the race to the bottom so to speak and and it's just to to wrap up this point like it's an abandonment of spiritual principles right because like we can think of all the great spiritual stories and narratives, whether it's Jesus or Buddha in political terms. Like I've always liked to think of Jesus as a political rebel. Right. And, you know, that, that whole, that whole story is part uh, like the whole idea of Jesus is part fiction too, you know? So it comes back to this idea of stepping out into the broader meta frame. Like we can't even, have the conversation about Jesus without the, the meta frame that, uh, you know, uh, entertains a series of assumptions that, uh, you know, Jesus could have never, might n- never have even existed, or, or we can completely, uh, like, um, like de- demystify and desacralize 
his existence if, if he if he did exist you know so you can like humanize him as a person and as a as a political agent so this is this is the true meaning of metanoia you know this is the deep through line of all kind of uh, uh world religions if you will and um if if they if and when they don't come together as we're seeing <clears throat> um there, I mean, there's lots of reasons <laughs> for that, but I'm trying to hold individuals to account because we're talking, you know, there's the conversations about individual sense making and collective sense making. And until we, uh, you know, like really dissect the different abstractions that, contr that can that control the discourse in this way, um, we're, we're never, we're never going to evolve like socially. So a common theme I'm seeing in some of your papers, Brent, and, you know, trying to think of, okay, well, what is the big picture? It, it seems like neoliberalism is the thing that keeps coming up is the thing that we need to overcome. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, it's actually, um, you know, every time I write the word, I'm conscious of the fact that, that the right thinks it's an empty buzzword and that, um, you know, that it doesn't mean anything, but it does mean something very specific. There's tons of great resources uh, from from a critical perspective on what neoliberalism is um so it's definitely a pernicious force and just to uh i mean i mean there's there's good things too but like let's just try to view it in context right so so uh, i'll try to define it by and large like um sort of uh to capture all the the relevant aspects right so it's this new economic consensus globally that free trade and free markets uh should be the top priority from a governance perspective and and this has been dominant since the 70s and the effect of what it does is um enriches capitalism itself as a system um but then also uh uh helps siphon a lot of that money upwards into the into the uh the the ruling class uh, let's say, and, you know, because I'm reading uh, Bjorkman right now, there's a, a, a image that sticks in, in my head that's um, the invisible hand of the market uh, cuts, cuts the, um, sorry, bakes the cake. And then there's another hand that cuts the cake, right? So there's actually two invisible hands to the market. Um, and this, uh, you know, the idea of just the one invisible hand doing justice to people and environment via markets is a myth. Um, and it's a myth that, uh, you know, it's in, in concrete terms, it's called market fundamentalism. It's when you you're a fundamentalist about markets. So you believe that that's the only way. And then, and then your, your, your worldview and your behavior uh, become in service to that principle, whether it enriches you personally or it enriches uh, your class or your friends or your company or, or whatever. So, you know, um, <clears throat> I, I will defer to the experts on, on the critique of neoliberalism, you know, because they're, because they're out there um, uh, rather than try to reproduce it myself. But I, I tried to, I tried to just do that anyways, just to provide an answer. Yeah, I, I posted in the chat and I'll also post it in the show notes, uh, a great mini doc that just came out with uh, the Michael Brooks show. It's called uh, The Neoliberal Implosion. And it's featuring uh, a researcher, political thinker, Mark Blythe. So it's, it's a very good rundown for those of you who are curious and maybe who, who do have that expertise background to kind of to see, uh, it's just like 10, 11 minutes, but just a very interesting historical overview of the past 35, 40 years. But from what, I'm, from what I understand too, Brent, it's, it's uh, as you're saying, it's this sort of fixation on the market as the answer to all of our problems, essentially. Uh, deregulation, um, uh, kind of the, the shrinking of the role of, uh, the uh, of our national institutions to manage the markets, right? And to, to manage actually huge swaths, let's say, um, uh, privatization of uh, of jail systems or, pri you know, pri going private, right? Deregulating the markets, pushing things more towards this glo globalized and deregulated market. Um, 
and Bruno Latour talks quite a bit about that too, which is partly the theme of the, of the, the, or the title of our podcast, the whole idea of coming down to earth, the whole trajectory of neoliberalism is this kind of, um, uh, arc into nothing, right? It doesn't actually, it, it's not compatible with the actual resources um, or um, dynamics of a living society just in terms of our needs and our welfare and, and, our, and our just sustainability, right? So yeah, it's a good documentary. I'm going to share it um, for those of you who are interested and does a much better job than I just did trying to explain it. But uh, yeah. Well, it seems to me again, you know, that the, something the left and the right have in common, and you look at the populace, is that both people, or the people on the ground seem to be suffering as a result of this financialization of the world. And what I think the argument is with sort of central Democrats is that they're on board with continuing this style because that's what enriches them, and they're the ones that kind of feed the politicians. So I guess from a metamodernist or intergalist kind of point of view, um, I mean, you know, the whole don't, I mean, to me, it's like, that's the common enemy and how do we continue? And I think that was Bernie's point. And I think my favorite thing from Chomsky was the only thing that can keep these corporations in check is government. And so if you are anti-government, I would just kind of advocate for understanding how the main beast right now might be the corporations and how they're really pulling the strings here. And, and how can you can unite around that cause? Yeah. I mean, that's what I want to see. The, the narrative has, like, you know, t things have become more polarized, despite the fact that there's this clear opportunity to come together via, via populism by economic populism, <clears throat> it, it does come back to something I said earlier about people on the right just being insincere. Like Steve Bannon, right, is an economic populist, self-described. Um, but, you know, and he's very active, you know, he's, he produces documentaries and, and he helped get Trump elected in 2017. But he's a fucking liar, right? We need to be honest about like, the credibility of these people and it's difficult because he's very sincere he's very transparent it's really hard to see right like i i learn from listening to someone like steve bannon or, or peter Thiel or whoever but at the end of the day they pick what side that they're on and not only that their policies don't deliver justice they don't deliver economic f fairness in any way so whether they believe their own BS or not is besides the point because we have to get real about what the what the universal bipartisan policies are, right? It is things like Medicare for all, Green New Deal, <clears throat> etc. And again, the people who are responsible for obstructing this, this simple truth that benefits all Americans are Republicans and centrist Democrats. Um, so I wish, you know, Bernie had actually addressed uh, Republican voters more directly, you know, there's all these kinds of things that I wish the Bernie campaign did differently. Um, we, we can, we can actively try to depolarize more, right? Whether it's, whether it's going to work or not is a little bit besides the point because you have to, you have to experiment with a lot of these things. Um, Bernie was not getting experimental, but, but he was always right in the sense that for years he's been, I can't remember who's, who said this. I think a lot of people have been saying this, but Bernie is, uh, maybe it was the serfs. Uh, give, let me give a shout out to the serfs. But Bernie is like the crazy conspiracy theorist guy in movies like Independence Day and movies like um, 2012 or whatever, right? He's the guy who saw it coming, who saw the shit storm coming and tried to warn everybody. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, because it's not a, a partisan issue, but nobody listened to him. You know, as these movies go, <laughs> that guy gets ignored. The uh, apocalypse happens. So, um, he usually dies so. first in the movie too, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, to tie it back to like McIntosh, I, I actually think he's doing the right thing. But, but look, look what's happening. He's been trying to do this for years and people are ignoring him just like they ignore me and lots of other people. Uh, 
for whatever reason, you know, they just, they don't actually care or know good enough to know that pursuing depolarization is a good idea. Um, I, and I think at the same time, like, like Steve's platform isn't going to work without um, br bringing in more serious political analysis and also like respecting the different levels uh, I was talking about. So the average voters that are, that are polarized, you know, like how, how they get depolarized and then the intellectuals, how they depolarize. These are quite different processes and <clears throat> take a lot of uh, time, and, time and energy. Um, but, yeah. but to simplify, it's like a narrative warfare, don't you think? I mean, yeah, there's a lot. Absolutely. I mean, that's what we're that's what we're engaged in right now. Everyone has a narrative, and everyone's attacking each other. And at the end of the day, you have to try to simplify you, our own integral meta modern narrative and try to say, here it is, and here's how you move forward. As Ryan was sort of saying, what what do you what can emerge from this? And this is more for a conversation, not for you to have all the answers, Brent. I mean, right. you know, I just think as far as what we're, you know, sort of looking at all of our different points and trying to find out where's the baby here and what's the bathwater, um, you know, that, at least to me, that's kind of where we're at, it seems. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, I, I, I struggle to answer a question like this because I have two two versions in my head. One is my ideal scenario, which you guys kind of asked about before. Um, and then one is like the realistic, you know, meeting people where they're at and uh, working within the institutions to do this. But I definitely think like, like, you know, Bernie is still sort of the leader, but if, if he's not going to be president and we're in this sort of post Bernie uh, era, then, then it is on us individually to like put ourselves into those difficult spaces to argue with people. Like it's, it's really difficult because I'm, I'm on one hand, I'm trying to argue against all that uh, f frivolous jockeying and contrarianism. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's prone to continue. Like, at any rate, though, like my feeling now is that uh, with Bernie um, in in a in a subordinate position, like this isn't a personal loss for us. What 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 it actually means is everybody everybody loses. So a part of the the conversation going forward has to be kind of mourning that mourning mourning the loss of the opportunity, and and different people who stood in the way. Um, having that reckoning themselves, like nothing makes me happier than when somebody changes their mind about something uh, like important and serious and real, like a particular policy point. Uh, and, you know, for example, Peter Dow comes to mind, like he's somebody who's been active on Twitter, like, like in a very like transparent and accessible way about how he was anti Bernie in 2016 and kind of had a conversion, right? To see how this whole world was against Bernie and he was a part of that world. So we need to see more of those happen in a kind of cascade fashion of tipping points, like people coming out going, oh my God, I was so wrong. And, um, you know, there's other examples that stick with me, like like uh, Sanjay Gupta on CNN, you know, like this is years ago, but he had a segment that was like, hey, I was wrong about weed. You know, I was completely wrong. This is why I was wrong. This is why weed has to be legal, et cetera. So there's those kind of like basic truths, right? That we need more kind of, let's call them like epistemic whistleblowers. You know, and there's another guy I follow on Twitter. Uh, his name's <clears throat> Ryan something, I forget. But he was a big Warren supporter and switched over to Bernie, right? Right as all this kind of Warren Bernie feud was intensifying at the last minute. And, and now he's, you know, he's had a kind of realization uh, about how he was, how, how stuck he was before and how now he's kind of come out of the closet for Bernie, so to speak. Immediately he was attacked by, by so many people, right? So there's, as people start to advocate more and switch teams, it reaches a tipping point, right? And we start to have new conversations 
uh, based on that new reflections and, and key actors can, can pivot in that sense and, and change the tide. But, <clears throat> you know, there's a sense in which it's too little too late right now, but there's also a sense in which, you know, nothing's changed. We have to keep fighting until things change. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is something that uh, Michael Brooks has been talking quite a bit about, or just a lot of leftist media platforms. But I'm bringing up Brooks specifically because he's articulated this as, as a moment of self-assessment for the left in terms of even if, as he said, um, 90% or 95% of it wasn't really something that the left did wrong during the campaign, and it was really just a massive um, uh, pivot of centrist power in terms of everyone coronating Biden and the media blasting his, his electability, you know, um, even if there's only 5% that we need to work on, we need to work on that. It's, it's actually, it's on the left to, to uh, uh, refine itself and to master media narrative and to create counter narrative, right? It just, in, in some sense, we have to be as perfect as possible because the uphill battle won't allow any other way, right? So this is kind of a moment, I think, for internal self-reflection, um, discussing things like what we're talking about here, discussing things like, okay, well, if the left isn't very good at coalition building, then we need to figure out how we're going to do that, right? We need to figure out what the next move is if we're looking at potentially eight to 12 years of uh, a, a centrist candidacy or presidency on, on, in the Democratic platform, just in terms of if, he, if Biden chooses Harris, right? Um, we have a Biden-Harris ticket. Biden has a one-year term, and then Harris goes for her term, and then her re-election term. That we're looking at potentially 12 years of the same ideological. Let's not get too far ahead there with the <laughs> speculation. <laughs> that's, that's way too far yeah, ahead. No, no, it me. is. It is. We're talking about um, his VP pick and stuff. <laughs> yeah. But we're we're looking at we're looking at a time where we we really need to pivot into how do we yeah. build. A Look, new my my vision for this decade, like like I've had it for a while, but it began on January 1st uh, because that's, that's this decade. And no, <laughs> nobody's going to like, like everyone's talking about a paradigm shift, but yeah. failing to commit, right? And I see it, you know, temporally, this is the window. Whoever is in charge, fucking Trump, Biden, Sanders, it doesn't matter. Like, like going back to Matt Crispin, like he really put it well. It's like, like, like us hardcore Bernie supporters, like none of us ever believed that it was just about Bernie and, and what powers he would have. It was always about the movement and about Bernie being a kind of preparedness for the crisis. Like that's what Matt, Matt really crystallized. It's like we knew, knew the crisis is coming and Bernie was just the kind of safe bet. So that, you know, that window is, is that door is slammed in our face nevertheless the plan has to go forward so like in my emergencia article like my Gerpel's thesis is about the socio-technical systems transition she speaks in terms of 10 to 15 years changeover and 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 that it's the time frame we're in now like it's not when we all agree in 2050 okay now let's start this 10, 10 to 15 year transition it's now so all of my writing kind of dovetails with that too and uh uh, Smart Cities book that I worked on that's coming out soon um, tries to like it's not accelerationist and it's not <clears throat> uh, specific in terms of predictions, but we have this idea of convergence that we that as as a methodology and as a, a, like a set of interlocking theories of convergence that um, that it dovetails with the socio-technical systems transition argument so that it has to happen now. So now what is kind of scary and what we know we have to do is some sort of de facto coalition with all the, um, <clears throat> you know, like wh whoever, if it's uh, like Silicon Valley or kind of the uh, techno optimists, like, or, or or the financiers, you know, they they've they've got a kind of knife to our neck, but we have to like cooperate with them. Like we need their resources, we need their commitment to the progressive values, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's no compromise here. Like Bernie or no Bernie, the benchmark for uh, uh, survival and systems change is things like a Green New Deal. 
Medicare for all. Like we just have to keep holding that ground. And if anybody wants to debate them, then it's just going to be an ugly mess. Like we've already seen between, you know, with the, all, all these right wing, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, provocateurs, you know, like Steven Crowder or, or, or whoever it is, like they have no clue what they're talking about, but they're very good speakers. They're, they're very persuasive. They're, you know, kind of, I don't want to say funny, but they, but people on the, you know, they, they, they attempt humor appealing to the right, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it's, there's no, there's no, like we can, it's all, it's all fun and games. There's no substance there because at the end of the day, um, universal healthcare is a, is a human right. And it's a, it's a, a post-partisan issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So I guess my next question as we start to wind to the end of this episode, Brent is um, what are some of the next steps that you are taking and that we can take to move this forward, especially with the TO new deal. And if, if our listeners found that idea appealing and they want to get involved, what's kind of the next step for them to start contributing and having this conversation? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, to bring it back to the Teal New Deal, like that is a kind of a col collaborative project beyond me, which actually it, it is, is designed to enable me to sit at the table uh, with others who, who have an integral background or, or progressive values or whatever, and they're having trouble reconciling that. <clears throat> so we're beginning to do that. We need to keep doing that. You know, I would encourage anybody who wants to, to reach out to me and have uh, exchanges or private conversations uh, because this is just the continuation of the move, the movement, you know, not me, us. And was there a plan, uh, just to clarify with something you're talking about with layman, was there a plan to have like a group, like regular group discussions with the TL New Deal? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like practically like there's lots I'd like to happen. I talked to Peter Lindbergh about it last week. Uh, you know, uh, I'd like to have follow-ups with people I talk to like, like Terry Patton, but a lot of that is slow coming together, you know, and I'm, I can't be the key organizer behind it all. Like, like I'm one of them, but I'm also just a participant. So this is still something that is like up in the air and it's a collaborative project and it's only what we make of it. That's, mm -hmm. that's what all any collaborative project is, you know, we have to make the best of it. So I definitely invite, you know, um, it to expand into more <clears throat> Uh, group calls like this and much bigger ones, you know, because I've been in some group calls with like 20 to 60 people and, and with some of you guys too. And so it's possible. And it's, it's gonna, you know, we can have many sessions with many different facilitators and it'll have a different dynamic each time. But I'll be content at least if it's reaching that minimal kind of viable level of discourse for actually like Going, going beyond the impasses and, and the negligence of different areas that, that have hamstrung all intellectual discourses for the past four years. And where do we find you online in terms of where do, where do people go? Twitter? Go to Twitter at Tato underscore tweets. Um, and then that links to everything else. Uh, the website is abs-tract.org. I publish mostly on Medium, and I'm in lots of you know Facebook groups uh, of of different varieties, and so these these types of discourses carry on on many different channels, and um, let's all get uh, connected and and uh, have solidarity. Let's do it. Thank you, Brent. It's been great. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, we'll thanks, talk Brent. To you soon. Thanks, Brent.